Word of mouth. 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 This is Word of Mouth from NHPR. I'm Virginia Prescott. Fake uniforms, surreptitious GPS trackers, torches to sever anchors, alcohol, prostitutes, even witch doctors. These are among the tools of the trade for a handful of repo men scouring ports and waterways around the globe. Often hired by banks, insurers, or ship owners, they operate in the ill-regulated, highly corrupt, and unfathomably vast seas, where each year tens of thousands of ships are stolen, impounded, or swindled, not by Somali pirates, but by white-collar buccaneers. Ian Urbina is investigative reporter for The New York Times. He's uncovered stories of slavery, summary executions, stealing, and selling organs, all taking place on the high seas. His most recent report is on maritime repo men. Ian Urbina, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. So what a story. What, what kind of ships are these repo men, and they are all men in your story, hired to find? So... Most often they're hired for an order of ship called tramp steamers, and these are typically older cargo ships. They're big, but they're not, you know, Captain Phillips-style container ships. They're not the huge ones. Um, and tramp steamers are uh, a certain order of cargo ship that doesn't have a home port and kind of lives job by job and typically are bouncing between second and third world uh, countries, you know, moving foodstuffs or fuel or raw goods, computers, um, from one place to another. And those are the most vulnerable because they're going to ports that are notoriously corrupt and uh, they often don't have insurance and sort of they're easy prey for um, scam artists. So these repo guys that you spoke to, they get hired to negotiate or recover or extract. That's a term they use. Now, how often does it actually come to that? Not often. You know, so the the vast majority of repo work is kind of a ho-hum affair with, you know, paperwork and police who, you know, serve um, an order and it's carried out. And that's true the world over. A small subset are more entangled where there's some sort of um, complication. You know, maybe uh, the person who is supposed to have their ship taken says, sure, yeah, I did damage your port, and um, I, I can't pay for it, so you can take my ship. Um, but someone else gets involved, like the local dock where it's stuck, and says, wait, you can't take that ship because they owe me money. And then it gets entangled. And so th- these are sort of when it gets dodgy, and they fly in one of these you know, extraction guys you know, who um, are specialized in this. And step one is to try to negotiate as one guy said, negotiate them back to planet Earth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a a million-dollar ship could be looking at a $50 million fine because the locals don't realize that's a ridiculous sum. And so the guy is flown in, and and he um, has to sort of talk them back down to the reasonable realm. If he succeeds, then, you know, they pay it off, and the ship gets on its way. If they fail, then the ship is still stuck, and that's when, as a last resort, an extraction occurs, which is sort of a waterborne jailbreak. Tell us about some of these extractions. I mean, really sound dangerous, for one thing, but also really challenging. You uh, talked to Chris Meacham. He is based in Jacksonville, Florida, a maritime repo man. He and his team spirited hundreds of boats out of a marina in Mexico. How does this happen? What these guys, you know, again, like you said, they're all guys um, that I spoke to, um, typically do is uh, have a, they first of all have a decided policy of never being armed and never using violence. So, Mm. you know, most of these guys also have an ethic of the crew are just sort of innocent middlemen, bystanders, if you will. And and so they never um, do anything to harm the crew. that means if you're not going to use violence and weapons and intimidation, then you're going to have to use guile and 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 kind of um, trickery. And um, so most of them do just that. They they sort of go in, they do surveillance, they figure out kind of what the landscape looks like. Quite literally, you know, can they get the vessel out? Um, or is it being blocked by other vessels? You know, how well guarded is it? Are there downtimes, you know, during shift change of the night watchman? All these sorts of things. Um, uh, And then they often hire locals, you know, prostitutes or street kids or bar owners or 
the like to help them either do surveillance, which sometimes involves getting someone on the vessel to see if it has fuel, to see how many guards are on there. Um, is it even the right vessel? Sometimes these have been um, you know, welded to look differently, painted over, et cetera, and you need to get to the engine room and check the serial numbers on the engine to make sure you're even looking at the vessel that you're supposed to recover. So I guess that's where the costumes come in. Yeah, you know, I, I, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, I, I would never have maybe a better fiction writer than I would would have thought this stuff up. But, you know, a lot of these guys have um, a closet of, of uniforms, sort of all-purpose uniforms, overalls, you know, royal blue overalls or gray overalls or whatnot. And they, and they take some of them and they have business cards and they sort of size up the situation when they get in country and decide, you know, what ploy might work, if any ploy is needed. Sometimes it's basic, you know, you just watch and you realize there's a gap in the middle of the night when it's not, no one's watching and they swim out and they climb on board and, and they start it up um, and they run and they run to the 12, you know, is what they call it. Um, the 12 mile line is the dividing line between national and international waters. And if you can get into international waters, then you're pretty much in good shape. Ian Rubina is with us. He's an investigative reporter for The New York Times. And he's uncovered these stories of, of men hired to take back ships that have been stolen, docked, scrubbed to hide their identity by gun runners and human traffickers and even terrorists. Well, you spoke to a Haitian Coast Guard official who referred to them as vigilantes. So so what's happening here? Is what they are doing legal? No, I don't think it's legal. I don't think it's illegal. I think it's sort of extra legal, you know, um, you know, and, and I'm not trying to be Pollyanna, but I do believe that um, right laws reside in country for the most part. There is international law, right? But but most laws that apply to most of us in normal life are domestic or they're national laws. And the laws that these guys are breaking are, from one perspective, real and exist, and they're local, they're national or even provincial, um, and they are breaking those. They're sort of taking matters into their own hands sometimes and not um, properly contacting the police and having them carried out, and maybe they're even going around a local judge who said that they're not allowed to take it. On the other hand, what these guys would argue is that um, they are breaking one law because another law has been broken, uh, and that this is a... um, fraudulent seizure, uh, which is illegal, even if it's um, legal in country, it's unethical. And if they can just get that vessel to another jurisdiction where there's a level playing field, again, I'm channeling them. This is what they would argue. Um, And often they do. They take the ship, say, from Haiti to Barbados or a place, uh, the Bahamas, where these are countries where there's more sympathy in the courts to um, banks and American interests, for example, mm-hmm. than, say, Havana or Venezuela or Colombia or Jamaica. And so they take the ship there, and then they make their argument before a judge in those countries that their repossession was legitimate, and even if the Haitians or Colombians are not happy about it, um, you know, they want this judge in this country to decide the matter. Ian Urbina, you are a reporter, as you pointed out. But if you were a Hollywood scriptwriter, is there one of these capers that you would love to write about? Yeah, I mean, I think the most epic and dramatic one uh, was one involving a guy named Max Hardberger, um, who's got, you know, a name that only a screenwriter <laughs> could dream about, you know. Um, and he has... He's kind of an old hat in this line of work. He's been at it for a couple decades, and he's got a firm in New Orleans, and, and he's a sort of salty character who spends half his time in Haiti. And, and he had a, a job in Haiti some years back uh, where, you know, it was dramatic because for a lot of reasons. Number one, he had to really employ some uh, you know, he hired a witch doctor to publicly put a curse on a on this one place in this really seedy port that I went to with him, um, which was the only place in town where you could get cell reception. Uh-huh. And um, uh, so they put a curse there so that the police were too afraid to go to that field and call for help. That worked? Uh, it, it did. Well, no one called. Who knows whether it worked or whether no one thought to call, but no call went out to Port-au-Prince. Um, and... But it was just, you know, this whole repo, you know, was 
one keeper after another. You know, they hired prostitutes to get on board and size up the engine room and the guards. And then as they left, the ship broke down. And so they barely made it to national waters. And it was really dodgy for a while. And finally, they got it running again. And they, they outrun these guys. And so it, it it was the most dramatic. And I talked, you know, these things sound like they can't be true um and you have to be skeptical on that one i dug pretty deep and got into court records and talked to other people in haiti who witnessed or were involved with it from both sides of it uh and verified it as a legitimate story so that's the one that i would put on the silver screen (laughs) ian urbina thank you so much for speaking with us thanks for having me ian urbina he's an investigative reporter for the new york times and you'll find a link to read some of the stories he has uncovered about human trafficking and slavery on shrimp boats and piracy on the high seas including the photographs terrific photographs and full text of his most recent report maritime repo men a last resort for stolen ships the link is at wordofmouthradio.org <laughs> 